I wanted to have this discussion because I wanted to pull back to have a, a, a larger context to why VR and, and journalism together. And the excuse that I hear for VR all the time is that it brings empathy. It puts you in someone's position. You can understand where they are, which I think is, is, is valid and is correct. But it then raises a whole bunch of questions about how you do that. And as Kerry said, what your responsibilities are around that. Then secondly, I wanted to raise this out of the geek world and the gadget world into empathy in journalism as a whole. So that's why Laurie is here as the non-VR person in the room, the two-dimensional journalist. Uh, and so we'll, I'll explain that in, in a few minutes. But uh, Sarah, you've done, so Sarah has done, Sarah is, is from the heartland, first and foremost. Silicon is, Prairie. Yes, which is really important for Missouri. Uh -huh. And uh, X uh, TV News, and uh, was one of the real leaders in trying to understand how to use social and change the relationship with the audience, with the public, when you were on TV. Since then, you've left. You've done a lot of work with veterans and now VR and VR companies. And in that process, uh, Sarah's just released some research today about um, the actual brain changes involved with VR and empathy and what they trigger. So why don't you start off and tell us about that? Yeah, it's actually our colleague in Portland, um, Oregon, Dr. Jeff Tarrant. So you can read the study. I don't know if there's a doc, but if you go to medium.com slash Sarah Stories, Sarah with an H, Sarah Stories, um, you can see, see the research and what uh, Dr. Tarrant did, and he's done three different case studies on immersive media and how it affects the, affects the brain, is looking at can immersive media be compounded similar to how you would compound medications to mimic the effects of certain psychotropic medications. Now, certainly we're not talking about with immersive story um, that any of these stories could be a virtual Prozac or anything like that, but what he's found in this research is with the linguinal uh, gyrus, the parahippocampal gyrus, and that's how I have my la laptop here because I'm a journalist, not the, not the scientist, but um, it's fascinating to read because it shifts, it can shift the brain into pro-social emotional states. So they're not just watching the video, they are feeling the video. And if they are feeling the video, you know, in the future, are media consumers going to be wanting to consume media on the basis just of information, or are they going to be wanting to consume journalism, feature journalism, on the basis of how it makes them feel? So, um, you, you know, that's, that, that's essentially what his research and, and um, our role is. We're, we're like on different sides of the piano. I press the keys and he tells us what music is coming out of the brain. And then we see how do we compound those stories in a way that can story up veterans, people who are experiencing uh, baseline symptoms of depression and anxiety. We're not talking about um, a virtual Prozac or, or something that could replace those drugs. So you're not just trying to inform someone, you're trying to have an impact on their mood and their lives and their, and their viewpoint, yes? With story. With story. So yes. say a little bit more about how the hell you do that. Okay. Um, with character, all the different storytelling inputs. So storytelling is no longer flat. Uh, you have inputs, it's not just video and audio. You have haptics. You have hand controls with Oculus Touch and the Vive. You have not only positional audio, but you have vestibular audio. Um, Interim has some 4D headphones that are out that you're actually feeling the audio and you're, it moves your body along with it. So all of those different storytelling inputs we are manipulating them and then seeing, okay, what does that do to the brain on the other side? Because if they're truly feeling story, then you know, shouldn't we as storytellers want to know or, or be able to use that as a therapy tool to actually help people? So give me a specific example. If you've got a vet who's come through PTSD, uh, what kind of story are you telling? You've given me all the, kind of the science and the technology behind the measurement and the impact, but as a storyteller, What's the story you're telling? Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you that because we're at the beginning of the okay. beginning of the beginning. We have our hands on the keystrokes, and we're pressing them, and he's telling what's coming. Oh, so out. the first step was to was to determine the this story kind of input algorithm, output. right? Um, it, it in order to create uh, these brainwave patterns, essentially that uh, the, our platforms are categorized by brainwave patterns on the basis of empathy, mindfulness, and motivation. But um, we're at the beginning of the beginning of the beginning, so I can't tell you what you know that story algorithm look like looks like, other than we're, we're figuring it out. 
Darren, um, so you you said to me that you're not a journalist. You're you're a filmmaker. You're a documentarian. But everybody's a journalist now if they if they want to impart information. Um, and you dealt you deal with things that have high emotional impact on their own as a story in any form. As Sarah is finding out scientifically, uh, you can amplify that emotional impact, uh, that, that feeling of being there, that, 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 that sense of empathy with this. What are the ethical uh, issues that you see raised by this power that you have to change somebody's damn brain and make them empathize and, and, and see the world differently? Well, I mean, it, it's interesting to have like actual evidence <laughs> uh -oh. uh, to go, oh, oh okay, yeah. We, you know, I think uh, generally, ethically, I mean, we have to be careful anyway. I think I, I'm, I'm drawn to, there's a scene in uh, Indefinite where somebody describes uh, an inmate setting himself on fire, and it's quite a disturbing scene, which we've dealt with in a certain way um, to make it not massively gruesome. But, but, but you know, we, we, just, we really wanted to show that because it is a reality of that situation. Uh, although, you know, part of me felt that it was quite gratuitous in a sense, like, do you need to show it? Um, but knowing that we were doing it in VR and that it was an, a very intense experience and we wanted people to connect with this story and to connect with the reality of what, deten what the detention system was like, we put it in there. But it's not necessarily the right sort of... Um, the right sort of imagery that you want everybody to see. I mean, I remember I was at a film festival and there was a little kid putting, putting on invisible, or indefinite. And I said to the person, you know, like, maybe this is not the right thing to, you know, to show them. I think ethically, like, on a, on a wider, there's wider issues, I think, in terms of how we manipulate um, what we as filmmakers and journalists, like, put, put into these films. You know, I'm, I'm drawn by the idea, well, I'm drawn to, People saying a lot that certainly 360 video is, is it represents more of a truth than traditional media because you can see all around you, and I don't necessarily think that's true. I, you know, I spend quite a lot of time manipulating that sphere and, and painting stuff out and creating a world that I want in which I want to uh, for the story that I want to tell. So that can be used in all sorts of different ways. And so I think, you know, the power is in the hands of the creators in that sense. And with other tools like special sound and, uh, and, 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 and haptics and all these different things, that, that's only, that intensity is only going to increase. So I guess the question is, what are the checks and balances on, on those? And I, you know, I don't know. Oh, yeah. So let me explain why, why Laurie Goodstein is here. Um, before the election, um, uh, like Kerry, I was, I was worried that, we, and now this has been overused, but I think it was a little fresher thought at the time. We in liberal media, and I'm liberal and I'm media, we're not, we're not empathizing with, sympathizing, understanding, viewing half of America. And it's the half of America that voted for Donald Trump. And so I don't think that whether we predicted the election correctly or wrongly is an issue at all. But did we serve that half of America is the question. And in the midst of this, Lori wrote a piece about evangelicals in Indiana. Indiana, was Iowa. It? Iowa, damn. They're up in Iowa, Indiana, yeah. They're all, the, all the flyover dust. Uh, I, I used to live, I used to live <laughs> in <laughs> Iowa. I'm just making a joke. I, 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 I worked uh, yeah. uh, I worked at the Burlington, Iowa Hawkeye. Um, Iowa's largest newspaper, because they had the biggest paper. Um, <laughs> so, uh, right, so you were in Iowa and wrote a story about uh, evangelicals in, 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 in Iowa around a case of a, of a uh, chapel uh, that refused to do gay weddings, got into a big legal kerfuffle, uh, and, and then you were there kind of the aftermath after some time to see, to explain their world. And I thought it was an excellent story. I thought it was, I thought it was a story that truly did try to empathize with that group. And, 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 that, and what that meant was, I'll admit it's a soliloquy in a minute, I promise. But what that meant was that you were reflecting their world to the New York Times readers, to us. And, I, and in social journalism, one of the things that I've learned sitting beside Kerry in social journalism is seeing journalism as internally focused and externally focused. And externally focused is reflecting the world and telling someone's story so that you can have an impact. Internally focused journalism is information needs that community may have. And I've come to see that unless we can reflect the world of some communities, 
They won't trust us to inform them. So the first step, I think, is reflection. And I was struck by Lori's story about how well I think it reflected that. The final point is this, though. I called the minister in the story, and I said, how'd she do? And he said, she was great. She really, I, I could tell, was trying to understand us, uh, talk to us, listen to us, reflected that. The photographer, too, he said, took photos of the life of the church and the children and everything else, and, and, and I really respected his work. And I said, OK, your, your yes but is what? And he said, well, um, the first thing was that the headline talked about evangelicals in despair. And he said his parishioners came up to him and said, don't they understand? That's an oxymoron. Evangelicals don't despair. Oh. And so it said, someone at the desk in New York, I'll blame the desk, uh, did that. The second thing he said was the photos didn't reflect the life of the church. The photos reflected despair. That was the headline. Mm -hmm. right? And it was interesting to me how the connection that Laurie made, obviously, with that community, and there was a mutual respect and a connection there, our processes of journalism kind of broke a little bit, right? Uh, so that's why I wanted to have Laurie here, because to me, we can talk about the gadgets we have and the, and the synaptic responses and all this great gizmodery, um, <laughs> all our great gizmos. But at the end of the day, journalism is still about understanding people and serving them and reflecting their worlds and, and building their trust. So after that very long soliloquy, I'm sorry for that, Laurie, um, talk about your view. You've covered religion for how long? 20, this is my 24th year that I'm going into. And, and you do it, as I said earlier, in the, in the godless New York Times even. Uh, it's not, not as godless as you might think. No. Uh, <laughs> even Mark Zuckerberg is finding, finding faith now. Um, so you have been talking to people who often don't see themselves reflected, and you reflect them. How do you see yourself as a journalist in this role of empathy? It, it was so funny to get that phone call from you and it, to be invited to be on this panel because this is just you know what I do. I, I don't see it as anything remarkable. It's um, it, you know it's just going in and listening and trying to as fairly as possible reflect um, you know not just the kind of social and physical reality, but with religious people. And the reason religion is so interesting to me is it's it's what make, makes so many people tick. And it's often the invisible thing that makes people tick. Um, so this uh, story that you're talking about was part of a series that we were doing on the national desk at the New York Times um, called Anxious in America. And we had kind of this sense that, I mean, wait, you know, a, a year before the election that, uh, that people were uneasy, that something was afoot, and we set out to try to capture that. But it was very open-ended. <laughs> Um, and most of the pieces were about economic anxiety, you know, about either young people without jobs or um, laid off factory workers. And, um, you know, we decided that one of the pieces ought to be about religious and cultural anxiety, that that was part of what might be fueling and eventually did end up fueling, I think, um, the, you know, Trump's victory there uh, in the, the sense that people were feeling that they had lost their country, um, that the America they knew, which was a homogeneous, Christian, white America, um, was slipping away. Uh, they were, you know, troubled by, you know, everybody sees these polls about the rise of uh, people with no faith. Um, and, you know, in people's families, they know that, well, you know, grandma went to the Lutheran church and I married a Methodist, so now we go to the Presbyterian church. And so in that generation, things were dis disintegrating a bit. And then in my grandchildren's generation, they don't go to church at all. And that's very disturbing to a lot of people. So that's what we set out to, to try to capture. And I ended up, I wanted to tell a narrative about people who I didn't, you know, my editor said, why don't you just go and go to a church and get people talking after services about all their anxieties. And um, I said, no, I was really looking for a, a story that I could tell, the people who had really lost something. And so this piece was about a couple who had um, run a business out of an old chapel a beautiful um, historic chapel, and they started out as a kind of, uh, you know, she's an artist. They were running a, um, 
a framing studio and a picture gallery and then a coffee shop and then they added a wedding business and they were having weddings in the chapel and what happened was one day along came a gay couple and uh, they denied them service. Uh, and so they were, uh, they were sued and they eventually ended up losing their business. They lost the building and the building was taken over by a conservative evangelical church that they now attend. Um, so that was, the, that was the narrative. But what was the kind of, you know, trying to, what was the challenge there in the storytelling is that in many ways, this couple was not at all sympathetic. They had um, discriminated against a gay couple, hadn't they? They had denied service to a very, actually very, talk about a, the sympathetic people in the story really were, were this gay couple who were looking around at the last minute. They had had a hotel where they had scheduled the wedding and the hotel uh, went out of business. And it was something like, I don't know, you know, eight weeks before the wedding and the invitations had already gone out and they were desperate. They were the sympathetic people. So the trick was, um, how to you know, have empathy for a, a couple of people who might, you, it would be easy to stereotype. Um, they were white, they were conservative Christian, um, they were living in Iowa, and they had lost a discrimination case. And you know, I've been thinking about how this relates to all this VR stuff, um, and <laughs> you know, listening to people talk about being able to transport you into the lives of people to see things through their eyes. And I guess what I was thinking, you know, that I hope that any kind of good journalism can do, no matter what the tools are that you bring to it, no matter what the technology is that you bring to it, I think it's possible to do that without that kind of technology. Um, I got an incredible response to this story because people said that for the first time, they could see through the eyes of this couple who, you know, really um, had been painted as the villains. They were the bad guys. And in part, what was so painful to this couple is that they did not see themselves that way. They knew that they were being called bigots and hateful. Um, and, uh, you know, they had lost their friends over this. Uh, there were people who turned their backs on them. They lost the business. Um, even before they lost the court case, they lost the business because people stopped patronizing their business. Um, they lost family members, their children and their family who won't speak to them, um, you know, brothers and sisters-in-law. And so from their point of view, how, what was the faith component in that that motivated them to risk all that? And they knew they would be risking that by denying service and by fighting the case. And it's not that I came to see them as um, heroes. I don't. But um, I did come to. I mean, I really, they're, you know, lovely, lovely couple and good people. Um, and, you know, they uh, just, you know, because they are biblical literalists, they read the Bible literally and they read certain passages of the Bible as more important than others. That was why they said that in, our, in this business that we run, and they ran the weddings themselves, um, they could not be a part of hosting a gay wedding, essentially putting on a gay wedding. That's where they drew the line. And so, you know, the story, I mean, what I did, really, it was so funny when you called me, because I was just doing the, doing the job. job. <laughs> I was just doing the job, and um, it was such a revelation that people saw it as something so fresh and so, so new, because as a religion writer, I do that all the time. I'm not the religious writer. I'm not, I'm not advancing any religion that I write about, but I am trying to get readers or viewers to see what is it that draws people to that faith. And sometimes they're you know, quite marginal faiths. I mean, this was you know, evangelical Christianity, very familiar um, to us, but I've written about faiths that are you know, very oddball, very even, you know, even cults. And if you listen to people talk about what compels them, um, what drew them, and what kept them inside of that faith and why they live it out in their lives, um, it begin, you can almost, like I, sometimes when I'm reporting, I have this moment where I pop in and I can almost see it makes sense. And it's, you know, it has a logic, sometimes it has a beauty. Um, and if you spend enough time seeing it through their eyes, um, you know, 
the, the, what I hope to be able to do is help the reader see that too, to pop in at that moment like so I So you're did. saying the first step is for you to empathize, yep. to be able to transfer that empathy then to the reader. Right. I don't want to geek, drinking some time. Uh, I don't want to geek out and, and turn that very eloquent view okay, of journalism I've, I've back into. I've talked for a while. But but no, 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 I'm about why I'm. Well, okay. I have to have to justify my presence here. No, 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 no. <laughs> not, that was not. That was not. A, I'm, just, I'm just trying to. Hal gets mad at me if I get over time. Um, I, I don't want to now turn that into a geek moment because it was, a, I think, an eloquent statement of what journalism needs to be, and I think especially now, there are all kinds of communities in America, uh, around the world as well. Uh, but, but, but we're in America, that we don't recognize, we don't empathize with, we don't understand, we don't, and we thus, they don't trust us. So talk one more second about what you have to do to get people to trust you so that you can understand them well enough so that you can then respond to the public. And then I want to come back to you guys. Well, it, it helps because I, I have been writing about religion for a long time to have a little bit of the vocabulary. And even if someone is going into it cold to have, if they're doing a piece about any community that they're not familiar with, to do a little bit of advanced work and know how people talk um, and what words you might come across that they use um, so that you can, you know, people speak in shorthand, especially, you know, people within a subculture, a religious subculture. Um, so that helps a lot. It's a way of saying, I know who you are, you know. Um, but I want to go. I want to go deeper with you. So that's that's part of it. And then I think also, um, you know, like with this story, I went in and I explained we're doing this multiple part series. It's about anxiety in America. I'm the religion writer. I'm here to hear hear about your um, you know your experiences about how the country has changed and explain how you see you know how you see where the country is going and what your concerns are and to convey those to our readers. And um, you know, if uh, a lot of times I'll just spend an awfully long time sitting in someone's living room or with the pastor in his office for really for hours, um, hearing about their their journey, their faith journey, but where they're coming from, and let them hand me however many pamphlets they want to hand me, or <laughs> however many books uh, they want to hand me about uh, their faith and their background. And you know, I find people want to tell their stories. Uh I can't help asking now, with your, with your VR colleagues from the New York Times yeah. here, uh, did anyone ask you uh, about making this story in 360? If you, if, having heard what you've heard today, what would you, and I'll come to you guys with the same question, how would you tell that story? Would it be helpful? Would it have told the life of the church better than a few still photos? Oh. What would, is that something that appeals or that says, oh my God, you're complicating my life? Oh no, I think that would have been wonderful. And I think we were just a few months early to be part of that. Um, but uh, I, I think in some ways what the piece was missing in the end was a feel for worship in that church. Um, you know, I attended uh, both as two Sunday services back to back. Sometimes when I'm reporting, I'll do five masses back to back. And when you do that, I mean, you really do immerse and you, you know, I mean, yes, I'm taking notes, certainly in the first service, but by the third one, you know, I'm really feeling it, you know, and I'm allowing myself to feel it a little bit. And I think Amen, that sister. VR, yeah, <laughs> and I think VR, VR could have done that for that story. So, Darren, yeah. mm. having heard this, mm. this narrative, now I want, now I want to play with, with, with you. If you were at the New York Times talking to Lori, how would you start to envision that story and that that goal of empathy in your terms? Well, I think, I mean, you mentioned it already, I think it was interesting that one of the things that they pulled out of one of their criticisms was, was the visual yeah. part of it, which is something that is very sort of editorial in terms of, okay, we, we want to tell this story, so we're going to use this picture, uh, which I think, you know, I think with 360, you, you, you can do a lot more. I think also, you know, I, when we're making a film, we t less about filmmaking sometimes is there is an architectural sense of what we're doing. And I think, in, you know, and, and how architecture, we look at architecture in terms of how we compose maybe or frame something in 360 in virtual reality as opposed to how you would frame it in, in a normal 16 by 9 frame. So you're dealing with an environment. And obviously, you know, with, in, with, uh, with people going to church, the, the architecture plays a massive narrative role in their lives. Everything in the church has some sort of significance. Uh, and, and that's part of that world. So I think probably I would start sort of there and, and look at those sort of kind of, that sort of architectural sense of how, how do I build this world in VR 
someone to experience what it is like to to be uh, somebody who is uh, very sort of kind of passionate about this religion and, and bring you into that world that way, potentially. Location, Sarah, location is a character. Obviously, you can mm -hmm. put people in the church, and you could also put them, you know, inches away from individuals who might not be like themselves. Um, so perhaps, um, you know, interviews with the um, the the gay or the the transgender couple. We did a project not too long ago for Love Has No Labels, where you are, you know, right next to people of different races, religions, social ec economic. Um, and, and genders, and you have the ability without having any kind of um, reality anxiety about what you might have from being across from somebody who is different from you, that you are able to you know, cohabitate that space and have a sense of empathy. But I also think that maybe is the first person uh, perspective in, in, in VR flawed in a way? Um, and I ask that because sometimes when you are in the first person perspective and you don't have the ability to look on the outside, you don't really have that sense of empathy. So for instance, we did a, a story in Zambia about a year ago about these people who have to crawl on the ground because they lack access um, to wheelchairs. And we thought we would tell the story from their perspective and show them the sharp rocks, the mud, the dog manure that they have to crawl through. But what we found when we um, viewed the footage in a headset and showed it to people is that it wasn't the first person perspective that moved them or allowed them to understand. It was seeing the people crawling towards them. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think um, at least in you know, some of the stories that, that we're doing where we do want you to, to feel a certain way, that it, it's helpful to show those that, that variety of perspective, not just being in their shoes, but being outside of their shoes and seeing them, them crawl towards you. I would also say, just to add on to that, I mean, there's, there's other projects that aren't necessarily narrative-based in VR, which are still factual, that, that kind of can do similar things to that. There's a project called uh, Machine to be Another, which I don't know if anyone's heard of, but uh, where you place a headset on and you have a camera that's facing out and you can see your own hands and you sit across from somebody else. There is something that, uh, uh, so you can't see the other person, but they reverse the camera feed, so you're seeing somebody else's hand and you kind of match that experience, and there's something very sort of vital about that experience. I did it myself, it's very powerful. And, in, and when you get people, potentially when you get people that have different, very fundamental different views, if you are able to do something where you boil it down to their, their very humanistic kind of, uh, you know, the, the humanistic values that they share, then there's something quite powerful in that. There's, there's a sense of understanding, I think, yeah. You know, there's lots of kind of possibilities in terms of ways of approaching a story like that. So, Sarah, you also, I don't want to treat you as a stranger in a strange land because you come in from the Midwest. But <laughs> you're, we, you're, we, we often use the New York Times as our metaphor for everything, and it's the except, grand exception to all rules. <laughs> you come from local television news experience, which people trust more than our print colleagues, and you come from the Midwest, which we fly over. Mm -hmm. so, so talk about at a broader perspective, how well you think journalism does with uh, empathizing with your neighbors? Um, in the, specifically the, the Midwest, I mean, we can have 20 inches of snow in the Midwest and it doesn't get on the news, but here in New York it can snow three inches <laughs> and it's you know, national news, news coverage. No. So you know, we are a, a forgotten uh, bunch when it comes to news coverage. You know us for tornadoes and, and um, things like that, but as far as empathizing with what we care about in the Midwest, we care about the same thing that, that you care about. Um, you know, we are all the same living, breathing human creatures no matter our ge geography, so um, you know, how does journalism cover what we think, I think VR is a great tool that would enable you, you know, to get more stories, more diverse individuals um, to hold up that mirror, not only hold up the, that mirror, but allow people to step inside the mirror and be the person who's looking on the other side. So I don't know if that, that's an answer to your question, but you know, in, in the Midwest, we don't always have those megaphones, right. certainly right. in VR. I mean, right. there, there is no VR scene, really. Um, in oh, no no not not there's there are great companies okay. um, in Chicago and and elsewhere that that are they're doing some fascinating things in the, in that space. So so we also talk about newspapers. We talk about let's call it still journalism, right? It's fro freeze dried. Uh, you come from television. 
I want to compare what, 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 what's happened to your worldview as a storyteller moving from 2D television, but still moving and still talking and still relating to this world. Mm -hmm. And I call it fixed frame only because in, in VR there is still a frame. It's just moving um, around, around the sphere. So in the fixed frame world, um, you know, we saw this evolution and, and I call it human media. So we had the live streaming phase. First we had still avatars, then we had the live streaming phase with Periscope and, and Meerkat and Hangouts. And we were all part of that where we were having more, um, you know, synchronous communication, more uh, living, breathing. I could see your body reaction when I instantly see you. And, and VR is the next iteration of that. It's the next iteration of human media. So now um, it's not just a flat world, our interactions are becoming much more human. I can reach out with my virtual hands and shake the hand of somebody on the other side of the world and via the bright vibrations in my haptic glove, you know, I can feel what that handshake is, feel, is, is like. It's those storytelling inputs that is making that human body, you know, more, more human. And so really, it's just the, the, the next step in media. It's, it's 3D, it's immersive. It's not just audio and video, it's inputs. Lori, as you hear all this this afternoon, what do you think about the standards and ethics of what this world ought to worry about? Well, I, I wonder about the manipulation factor. Um, I also wonder about the lack of ability sometimes to bring the context forth. Like, you know, if you're, if you're just following one character or seeing it through their eyes, you know, for instance, writing about, say, evangelicals, all right? Where is the added um, context that says, well, that's about 35 to 40% of the US population? I mean, that's a helpful statistic to have, right? Where is that, you know, I mean, I, I know where it is in a linear documentary. Right. I, I don't know where it is necessarily in, in Experience. VR. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and that helps people. I mean, w what we're trying to do is understand our world, right? And our, our larger world. And so those kinds of added value um, pieces of information that I think people need. I, I just, I, it's more of a question. Where is that in this, you know, in the, in the production? Let me ask, uh, Maury, are you around? Where is Maury? There you are. Yeah, come back up with you. So you did something that was frightening. People were scared to death of losing their sight, right? Well, no, I mean, the, the, the notion of blindness frightened people. Yeah, That's I think it's a very common question we all, all asked ourselves. So, so what I'm asking is, were there moments when you made your wonderful film where you said, ah, that would be too far, that would be too frightening? Uh, you know, where, where did you, see, were there boundaries that you saw as you made this in terms of getting somebody to understand, getting them to empathize, but not scaring the shit out of them, not manipulating them too much? There's actually one chapter um, where John tells about the first time he went outside uh, and there was snow outside. And that was the first time he went in snow uh, being blind. And so he lost all of his acoustic references, all the things he's using to find his way out uh, as a blind person. And so th this, this is a moment where he, was, he, he got very depressed because he said, OK, if I'm losing uh, sound, I'm just going to be screwed up because <laughs> I, ca I cannot find my way around. And this particular chapter, we um, wanted people to be a, a bit lost. So we, uh, as you, I don't want to spoil too much if you haven't seen it, but uh, uh, at some point, if you advance, we, we kind of play weird things, and you kind of lose uh, reference of the ground. You lose all of the reference around, and we spend quite a bit of time adjusting things that people would feel a bit, uh, um, you know, a bit weird, but not too much. So we, we we don't want people to be ill and remove the headsets and and have a strong nausea. So we, we tried to push as much as we could without annoying too much people. But that, that's pretty hard because uh, y people don't react the same to, uh, to the story and they don't react the same to the, uh, to the VR sickness also. Right. So it's very hard to balance and find something that suits for uh, everybody. 
So it, it's a kind of, w we did a lot of um, tests in, uh, each time we could go in festivals and have people try it, we tried different um, ways of telling this particular moment, different ways of uh, making them feel uncomfortable until we reached a point where we said, okay, this, it looks like some people... You, you knew there was a line you were testing. Yeah, we, we really tested uh, various ways uh, and also various ways of telling the story so that it would not feel too much um, anxious for people also. Clinical I'm take on, I want to pick up my it's friend like Paola Antonelli. Yeah, yeah, a bit like clinical trials, like trial and error. And yeah, you, yeah exactly. I'm clumsy. So Paola will be up very soon to interview Nani, but Paola Antonelli is my dear friend from MoMA. Yeah. And you must think it's very strange to hear us all talking about from this highly rationalized world of journalism, that now we're talking about emotions and making people feel. You live in the world of art where that's the whole damn point. This is very strange for us <laughs> in our world to try to get into this different world. Um, and indeed, we could argue this election was so much more about emotion, that emotion was anger, than it was about rationality and facts. And that's what we deal in. And we don't know how to mix those two. We're just learning how to mix those two. So do you have any reaction as, as an artist and as an outsider to our world about what you're hearing this afternoon? Well, I have a lot of reactions that on? Of, of many different kinds. Thank you. It would help if you, yeah, that's a right. A lot of reactions of many different kinds, not only as, uh, uh, as somebody coming from the world of design more than the world of art, so it's a little more objective, but also as an <laughs> Italian, because I was thinking as you were all speaking in Italian, uh, in Italy, you can't escape virtual reality in journalism, even even if you're reading, <laughs> in the sense that it's so baroque and so always like you feel like you're drowning in molasses every time you read an, a piece in the op-ed section of the of the Corriere della Sera. So I've always found it so refreshing to be in the United States, where there's this kind of uh, presumed or perceived objectivity. And, uh, uh, and I was thinking, gosh, virtual reality brings you back in this like too much feeling that I've been trying to run away from. Sometimes I feel that way, but then I hear Laurie and I know that um, objectivity is just a mirage and it's never really possible. It's just what you make of, uh, of the news yourself once you digest them and you metabolize them. So in a way, virtual reality by bringing perceived, ob uh, perceived objectivity into a completely personal sphere makes you get to this hyper reality more than virtual reality that in the end is what the news should be. Um, so I'm making it very contorted, but um, Jeff and I did together a program about curating uh, several years ago where we got to the point of thinking that curating and being a journalist are pretty much the same thing and they're based on the idea of trust and of, on having an audience. So I feel that whatever the means at our disposal, we all have the same goal, which is to uh, make people feel what we think is important. From that viewpoint, um, I feel that um, uh, manipulation is almost unavoidable. And we just can hope that our goals are good and higher, so our manipulation will move towards something that, in the end, is better. But, you know, it's a very contorted answer. <laughs> Let me go back to Carrie for one second. Because one, one thing that we get involved in a lot is the argument about journalism and advocacy. So manipulation, making someone feel what you want to feel, making them understand. I'm sure I'm making Laurie uncomfortable, which is what I'll do in a minute. Let's come back where, where the lines are, right? Where do you think the lines are in this notion of being an advocate, trying to manipulate, trying to put you in someone's shoes, trying to make you feel what they feel? Uh, where does that go over the line? Well, I mean, I guess for me, I've always thought that part of our job as a journalist fundamentally is to make people feel things, um, to make them feel upset enough so that they would do something about it. I mean, I think very fundamentally, the concepts of watchdog journalism, you know, the concepts of us being a public service, you know, all of that has always been intertwined with the idea of we don't report on police corruption because we think it's great and we want it to continue. I mean, there are uh, reasons behind some of that. I mean, I think obviously there's always going to be this really kind of tricky line when it comes to advocacy. Um, but 
at least to me, I think I think journalists that try to really have a very black and white and just label it and put it over in a box is there. There's the advocacy stuff. I mean, that's what I think is the most dangerous. I think really, in making a VR or any piece of journalism, I mean, I think the most important thing is to be conscious of what biases you yourself may have and do the best job that you can in dealing with those as well as you know being as transparent as possible about them in some way to your audience. There isn't like a simple sort of yes or no, do this and not that kind of guidebook with that. At least that's kind of what we talk about a lot in our program. So what does strike me today is we do see, because you talked about it earlier on the earlier panels about bringing in game design, bringing in documentary filmmaking, bringing in art, bringing in other things into journalism. And we have these new tools or tricks or you know at our disposal, but where's the line? So Lori, I'm going to go back to you one more time. The tools could tell the story better, but where do you see the line in, in, in this? I mean, when does it become pure entertainment? When does it become just manipulation? I don't know the answer to that, but I was thinking about what's, what's the point? What are, we, what are we doing here? Why, why are we drawn to this at all? And um, that, the, you know, to me, the purpose of this, I mean, when you talk about um, exposing, exposing wrongs, that's absolutely right, uh, and that's, I think, in some ways, the highest calling of journalism, which is why, to me, you know, the investigative reporters are the ones that I, you know, <laughs> genuflect to every day. They have, they do very hard work. What what I do is a little bit different in that the the point is to, you know, it's so easy right now in our world. We're demonizing one another. We are uh, making caricatures of one another. We are one-dimensionalizing one another in ways that are very, very dangerous. And so the value of this is to, you know, bring the full dimension. You know, who are these people? Like this couple I was writing about. Yes, they discriminated against a gay couple, but they're also artists, parents, um, people who serve the homeless in their community, um, people who have hired you know, gay employees. I mean, that's the dimension. And that's the value of this, is to see one another in, you know, in, in more dimensions and not just be able to um, you know, demonize people because we're seeing them only you know, in one dimension. So that, I'm sorry that I didn't answer your no, question. No, 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 but no, no, I, no, no. But it, it better, partly it's better because Carrie the was getting me thinking about what are we, what's the point. Well, you know? the other thing I hear you say, too, is that it's another function of journalism that I think we need to do a lot more of is convene communities to dialogue, to inform dialogue, to civilize dialogue, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, I've learned in, in teaching social journalism with Carrie, just teaching it teaches me a tremendous amount. But, but we thought about, you know, a, I thought about a community in isolation, and we realized very quickly, no, it was, it was at the point at which a community interacts with another community, that that's where the needs are, that's where the journalism can help, that's where we have to do things. And it's hard to convene that. And so when I hear this today is to be able to Imagine meeting that couple in Iowa, Iowa, um, in a different way that you could enable. Would I have uh, that that moment that you bring me in? You brought me very much in text, but would I feel a little more empathetic and sympathetic to them because of the technology, Sarah? Yeah, there's science to show that compared to fixed frame and immersive media, there is. It, it, it is more engaging. People watch it longer. They like it more. They share it more. Nielsen just released um, a study on fixed frame versus uh, immersive media. So if you're just comparing technology, you know, devoid of, of story, there is research that shows that. So one thing we've learned in this election, I think, was also that the fake news factories were far better at us at using the tools today of memes and uh, other devices uh, social tokens that people spread in their own conversations. They were spreading lies. They didn't have the truth from us to spread. If you were a bad guy wanting to use all these tools of manipulation, how could you imagine the fake news factories of the next generation using VR? Which is why we shouldn't leave entertainment to the other people. I mean, <laughs> it, yeah. it, it's, it's very important also. I think entertainment in this sense can be a, a way of speaking a common language and then having uh, sharing a different message. Like, like what you said, if you want to know better people around you and understand why they think this or that, 
you need time, and so you need to entertain people so that they are going to spend, give you some of their time to understand, learn about the community, learn about the people, etc. And if you condense that into 30-second uh, uh, news, you're not going to have this depth. So, so. so the purpose of attention that we keep on talking about yeah. becomes that. Uh, yeah. Questions, arguments, challenges, anything? Yes, please. And please continue to identify yourselves. My name is Adrian Sass. Um, among other things, I became a beta tester for Periscope today and huh. um, filmed my first 360 live broadcast. And what's neat about Periscope is that you get real-time comments from your viewers. And um, a lot of them were like, what's happening? How do you use this thing? You know, whatever, what do you explain to them? And then the comments that I got were um, not, I feel like I'm there, as much as, wow, I'm controlling the camera, mm. which I thought was, I wasn't like expecting. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering with what you two are saying about, you know, the, the, the story where the people are crawling to you and the amount of, is, it, is the empathic power of journalism actually transitive and that you can allow people to have your perspective as the third party viewer in the situation, not necessarily the people that you're covering? And then almost in an educational model, which arguably journalism can be, you, you're, you're using that, that tactic of pedagogy to empower people to explore for themselves and discover truth and facts. And I think that we've been confusing it a little too tightly, maybe, um, it just occurred to me, with, with being there and being a part of the story as opposed to being someone that gets to it, it, find out for themselves what the story is. Any, any reaction? I think, you, you know, watching Nani's story, and I, I'm, I would love to hear what her answer is, is to that, um, but, you know, that's essentially what VR journalism is, is you, you are deciding who is that tripod who is the camera, and giving them the ability to look all the way around. So that's one of the first things, you know, when, when we do a, st a story, we think, okay, who is the camera, and then who is that, that third party person on the other side that they, they need to think who they well, That's a neat, neat way to say it, yeah. Nani, you wanted to? Also, there's, you know, there's degrees of immersiveness. You also have to take that into consideration that being able to walk around with the full body, which is the high end expensive thing, is gonna give a more of a sensation of being there than when you're in a, the 2D 360 when you can't get any closer. But the, so that's a, you know, the interesting is the diversity of, of you know, of, of the technology. But, but the other thing is that when I first started this, you know, I, I felt like you did uh, in that you were out reporting the story and you were with these people and you really kind of understood the story in a way that perhaps your audience might not. And I wanted my audience to be able to get closer to the story and be the journalist, be the reporter, be the person on the ground, right, as Martha Gellhorn said, the view from the ground. And that was what started this whole thing for me was, you know, uh, I, I needed to bring my audience to be with me. Mm -hmm. And that was how to make them be the camera. Because I'm the camera, why should they be the camera? And wouldn't it be better journalism if, it, if, if they were? And that was my dream goal. And I, it's I, a, I love that idea of who's the camera. Go ahead. Yeah, it, it's a rub for storytellers because we've had control for hundreds of years, right? With the frame, the frame was how we controlled it, and so that's what the difficult part is: is suddenly all that goes out the window, and you have to find new ways to attract that attention. And real quickly, um, w back when you're talking about ethics and community, it's not just community among the you know the characters in our story, but community among ourselves as well. And you know, with Journalism 360, we had the opportunity to all get together and huddle and try to solve some of those um, you know, questions that none of us really have, have answers to. So I would just mention that for those of you who weren't here earlier, that you know that those tools and resources do exist to have um, a community of immersive journalists, to learn from people like Nani, and um, to be able to advance this medium forward. And let, let's plug again Journalism 360 for those of you who were here earlier, uh, which through Knight and Google and other parties is bringing together a community of people who are working in this field who can be very helpful. One more time for one more question, argument, challenge, anything at all. Yes. Hi, um, I'm the development editor with Coda Story. Um, we're a fairly small startup, which was actually incubated at the um, Entrepreneurial Journalism Center here. 
Um, I've spent much of the past year reporting from Russia about um, the campaign against LGBT people there and about disinformation. Um, and what really strikes me about VR is um, its great potential to be used for disinformation for fake news because of this, like you're saying, this very emotional experience, this emotional connection that people have to the story that if that was kind of fell into the wrong hands, it can be used to rise passions in things like the conflict in Ukraine and um, other kind of very polarized um, issues. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, here today we have some of the you know, pioneers of VR journalism um, in the world, not just the United States. I'm just, w what do you think can be done to prevent this from happening, from, to prevent it from being manipulated in the future, if anything? Um. Anyone? <laughs> That's a question for Has anybody looked at the audience uh, age for the fake news acceptors versus the non fake news acceptors? I'm just curious. Buzzfeed, BuzzFeed's done the most research, and I don't know. I, I'm just curious if there's a um, like a uh, figure on that. The reason I ask that question is just because I think that sometimes younger audiences are more sophisticated now as to the ability to create so readily for the web, and whether, in fact, that was what I was finding in my anecdotal research with younger audiences and asking them about that question. But I'm just curious if there's any data on that. Um, and then I'll leave it to you guys. I'll let you guys struggle with this one. I get this one all the time. <laughs> <laughs> How do we prevent the bad guys from taking over this wonderful yeah. field? What's the answer? What's the answer? Um, I, yeah, I, 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 don't yeah. Think th I don't think there is necessarily a way of policing it. I think the technology is only going to become more democratized, which in a way is a very good thing because at the moment, you know, it, it's in the, in the hands, the technology to make this sort of stuff is in the hands of people that are, I guess, in a way are sort of privileged or, or from a background that allows them access to that kind of stuff. The more democratization of technology means that we'll, <laughs> well, more people can tell more stories and, and, and that's really good for the medium because that will, that will enhance um, storytelling in this medium, it will, it, will, it will push it forward. How do you stop, I, how do you stop anybody making any fake news in any sort of medium, whether it's print journalism or a meme or, or whatever, I, I, I'm not sure you, you can, all you can do I think from my perspective, it is just make make the things that you're passionate about for the right reasons, and hopefully, truth will out. You know? I also think it's important to keep this discussion of the limits and lines and standards going. Uh, and, and journalism 360 is, I think, the place to do that, where uh, we have our standards that we set as journalists, and at least can stand by that. More, you want to last word? Yeah, I think all great tools comes with an evil inside. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, so uh, probably the best way to avoid that is to have uh, caring communities that, that will kind of curate content and will uh, it goes also with the, um, the Facebook bubble effect like if you're only connected with people that likes the same thing you like you're only going to see news feeds and that, that fits with what you like already so I think we, we need to spread out uh, caring communities that uh, you know care for uh, other things happening around and uh, this will somehow help to identify correct content versus uh, bad content. But yeah, there's not much we can do, I think. 